welcome everyone to 26 Presents, Tessa Ross, Controller of Film 4 at the Free Word Centre, sponsored by Quiet Room. Great films have the power um, to move you. When words, pictures and music combine in perfect harmony, I think it's an absolutely magical experience. I love Slumdog Millionaire, Happy Go Lucky, Sexy Beast, In Bruges, Last King of Scotland, and uh, all, these, all these films, just, just fantastic. Look closely at the credits. Um, one name is consistent throughout, it's Tessa Ross. Tessa is going to give you real insight into how these wonderful contemporary works of art happen. Let's give a very warm, free word, 26 quiet room welcome to the wonderful Tessa Ross. So what I was going to do is I'm going to tell you a little bit about Channel 4 and how we're built and how Film 4 fits into it. Um, because actually it's very relevant, because the idea is very simple. Um, and the idea is, in a way, how Channel 4 was built. Everything we do is funded by advertising. We don't depend on a penny of public money, but we're entirely publicly owned. And that's a really extraordinary model. There is no other organisation that works this way. So we go out and we earn all our own money every day. Not me, personally. I think I lose a lot of money. But actually, there are people in the building whose job it is to make sure we can do what we do. And we do it for a purpose. And we do it for a purpose because we're publicly owned. We're an answer to the BBC in the way that the BBC is the most brilliant, huge organisation that absolutely represents the status quo. We are the, with a little arg angry um, in a way, combative person on the side. We're a brilliant piece of the ecology of public service broadcasting in the UK. Well, that's how I would see it. So we're always asking questions. We're always being difficult. We're always doing things differently. And actually, and interestingly and really importantly, when we were set up just over 30 years ago, we were set up to build an independent production sector. So from an e economic point of view, we were fundamental in building what has become a huge economic drive in this country. Um, the people who started as um, independent production companies 31 years ago um, are a lot of them millionaires now and have made huge successes of businesses and have exported and created formats, programs, talent and have generated really a lot of the programs that we now think of as very mainstream. And the other thing that Channel 4 did and does do is represents different voices, is not set in the middle, but is trying to please some of the audience some of the time, not all of the audience all of the time, which is actually incredibly liberating because it means you're allowed to do things that are other, that come from different places and that really speak to different audiences. Um, so Film 4 is part of that. And as part of that ecology, Film 4 was set up it's really just after Channel 4 was set up by a brilliant man called David Rose. And David Rose came in and said, what about this? What, a, what about if all our drama was actually film and was made on film? Um, and the idea was to take the single film, not just put it on telly, but try and make it a cinema experience and to take it out into the world and, in, and give it a theatric life. Um, it started off with Walter, which wasn't a theatric film. Walter was, one of the, was the first programme on Channel 4. I don't know if anybody remembers that. It was directed by Stephen Frears, and it was Ian McKellen, uh, with Ian McKellen. Um, but when a film called My Beautiful Laundrette came along, it went into cinemas, and it became the beginning of what became, really, the launch of a whole new era of independent film production in this country. And David Rose did things probably as similar to the way we do things now as any other time in Film 4's history. He was a commissioner. He sat in an office. There were very few people around him, probably three. They read the scripts that were submitted to them. They met people. They came up with ideas. They were sent ideas. And they put money into film. And the only really big difference is they were able to put a lot more of the percentage of the money into those films then than we are now. A lot of the films you see up there are 25, 30 million dollar films. And I've only got 15 million pounds a year to spend. So my job is to make sure I can make as many of them happen as possible. So after David Rose, who it's, is still my hero and is still the most wonderful man, um, he's in his 80s now, and he set film, film on four and film four up with the most huge wisdom, really. People who are working with me now work with him then, Mike Lee being a brilliant example. Mike Lee's not in there, but Mike at the moment is literally on set making his next film about Turner. So Mike Lee has been through all of our history at film four and other filmmakers as well. Um, David Orkin came along after that and David Orkin expanded Film 4 and it started to be 
quite a rich pot of money. Um, and train spotting came out of that era. Sh era shallow grave came out of that era. Um, the madness of King George came out of that era. And they started to get really confident. They think they knew how to do things well and play with Hollywood and make money. Um, and actually, as he left, the man that took over as chief exec executive, Michael Jackson, um, believed this was, the, this was a huge answer to play Hollywood at its own game. And they set up something called Film for Limited, which was a bit like a mini studio, a standalone studio. And it meant they integrated sales, distribution, and production, which in the film business, which I'm really happy to answer questions on, is the way you control all of the pie, really. But in controlling all of the pie, they had to spend all of the money. And unfortunately, they spent a lot of money very quickly. And after five years, it was closed down because they hadn't made the money back. And it was a £35 million a year business with 70 people in it. And very, very sadly, um, it didn't really have long enough to make its money back. And if you look at the structure of the business, you would need years and years and years to wait for your hit to come, as well as millions and millions and millions of pounds to cover the possibility of risk before you could see that hit and make your money back. So there was never big enough, deep enough pockets for that structure to work, really, for, for film for then. Mark Thompson came in, who was until recently the DG at the BBC, so he came in as chief executive at Channel 4, and he closed the whole thing down. All those people were made redundant. It was truly horrible. Um, and if you have anything to do with the industry, you'll know there was a time where there was this huge hooray. Film 4 is there. It's got all this money. It's going to do the distribution. It's going to make big, ambitious, commercial British film. And then there was this terrible time almost immediately after where it was closed down. Um, I was offered the job, and I was offered the job with the words, I swear to goodness, defunct attached to Film 4 wherever it was mentioned or Googled. Defunct, the now defunct Film 4, the now dead Film 4. And it took me a very long time to get that word defunct off our name. But in a way, the, the way to do it now seems not simple, but it seemed simple at the time, which is to try and simplify the idea. Because in all these things, in all the big ideas about making a film or writing a screenplay or writing a book or any creative endeavour, as long as you can keep reminding yourself what the one simple big idea is, actually everything else is the complication that gets you there. And, and actually, that seems to me the big, the big thing we all have to hold on to. And the big idea was... How can we get the best work to happen with not too much exposure, not too much money? We didn't have much money. Um, in fact, at the time, Mark said to me, what's the least amount of money you can do it on? What's the least number of people you can work with? And how much do you think you can not risk? I mean, <laughs> um, but really, but that's not a bad way of looking at it, because if you think getting too big and too bold and too confident is a surefire way of coming down in flames, that's why I stand in front of you and think, please don't think I know anything, because I just want to keep working. The minute you think you know something, you're in big trouble. So... Um, I said I need £10 million. I needed enough to be able to spend the money the way I spend it, and I'll explain that a little bit later. I needed to be able to develop, which I'll explain a little bit later, but that is fundamental to the way we work, spend time and money on writers and time and money on, on thinkers so people can have those ideas. And I needed enough money to play the game with the big boys so that they believed me, um, which means that my money needed to sit at the table as though it meant something. Um, and that's a really interesting part of the film industry. Who sits alongside you as your partner? Who sits a song like, alongside you as your muscle? Because actually, as a filmmaker or as a writer or as a creative, you do need somebody to battle for you sometimes and to remind you of why you're in the room. Because we do, all of us, forget that. So he gave me 10 million quid. Um, and in that first year, um, I said to him, I want you to assume I'm going to lose all that money. I don't mean lose it. I don't mean waste it. I mean, I'm going to go out and I'm going to buy the best stuff I can. I'm going to develop the best stuff I can. And I'm going to make sure this is the nicest place for people to come in the business. So I'm going to make the deals really attractive for the independent production community. I'm going to be on their side. I'm going to make sure that the writers and directors believe that we care more about their vision than anybody else and that we'll work with them to make it as good as possible. And I'm going to make sure that I get the best team together in the country. Now... You, you say that and you think, oh, he believed me. But actually, some of those things came true because we kept on saying them. So it was just that really simple idea to be the best because in the end, if you're building a world for creative people, it has to be safe and it has to be clear and it has to be very clear what it's there to do. And there are certain things we're not here to do. Um, and I'll, I'll go into all of that. Before, I'm going to tell you a little bit about the team I work with. Um, 
we started off with a team of, I think, five people, and I've now got 20 people in the team, which sounds huge to me. Um, but if I tell you that three of them are in production, which means they're looking at budgets, and four or five of them, depending on whether or not it's part-timers or not, are doing deals. So they're de literally looking at huge numbers of contracts all the time. The editor editorial team is tiny. Um, there are three editors. There's one head, head of development, and we have an intern who does some reading for us. Um, we have three executive producers, and we have somebody who runs something called Film 4.0, which is our digital arm. And all of that is to make sure that we can protect the quality of the work, but most importantly, protect the vision behind the work. And what we do is this. We say to ourselves, well, what does Channel 4 stand for? How did, how did, how did I, when Mark Thompson said to me, have the job, do the thing of making film something he wanted to do again? Because he didn't shut down Film 4 Limited because he wanted to make film. He shut down Film 4 Limited to stop wasting money and make sure film didn't come back onto his channel for a while because it takes a very, very, very long time to build a film, as you know. You know, if I commissioned a script today, it might take a year or nine months for that script to be in a shape where I could show it to anybody else. So let's call it second draft after a year and a half or a year, you know, third draft after a year and a half, depending on the number of times we've met and talked and thought about how the budget might work. And then we've got a director on board or you've been working with that director. And then we go out to finance. And let's say it's another year because you need spring. You need the sunshine. You need, need something of the summer to shoot your film, probably, most likely. By the time you've shot your film and you've edited your film, it's another year. So really, a cycle of three years is tiny for a film. And generally, I'd say it's a five-year cycle for most development in films. So my job was to, to, to say to Mark, look, um, uh, I, need, I need the freedom to bring in the, the best stuff and to, and to buy the time to bring in the best stuff. Um, and so I went out and I spent a whole load of money on development, which is the absolute key to how you protect your relationships, um, the quality of the work, because what we needed to do was make sure we were delivering him films that he wanted to show on his channel. Um, if I said to you, I mean, it's really interesting what you think about what places stand for, but if I said to you, um, did you know that Charlotte Grey was a film for? I don't know if you did know. But it's a very unlike film for film. Whereas Control, which somebody mentioned today, which Anton Corbin directed, everybody thinks we did, which we didn't. But it does look like a film for film. Um, I mean, I do get praised occasionally for films I wish I'd done and I haven't. Um, but the truth is you know that you stand for something. And protecting what you stand for, which in Quiet Room's world is brand, but in my world is principle <laughs> um, and ethos and um, tone of voice and um, expectation and ambition of talent and all those sorts of com you know, conversations that we have. It is about risk. It is about not working to a known derivative market. It is about going to new places. It is about doing things differently. It is about supporting talent in a way that is fundamentally about their heads, not about our heads. So what I'm not doing is I'm not saying, um, well, if you did it more like this, this, and this, you know, more people might buy it. I might ask the question, should this be a lower budget because there's a small audience for this kind of film? but I believe in you, so let's do it this way. But I wouldn't say, if you could just make it a love story in the middle, you know, that might work. That's what a studio does, and that's fine. You know, those are the films that a lot of us go and see and have a brilliant time on Saturday night doing. But that isn't what I'm there to do. I'm not about the market. I'm about defining the new, in a way, the new mainstream. I'm about trying to go to the edges far enough so that the mainstream might develop further. Because if we all really did what had gone before, life would be pretty dull. And Slumdog would never have happened. As a very good example, it's the best example, um, because it's a film that nobody wanted to co-develop with me, nobody wanted to finance, and everybody said a film in Hindi will never work. Well, that's true. You know, if you look at what's happened before, that's absolutely true. But it really wasn't true when we believed in the various talents that were involved in that film and the script and the, and the, you know, the development of that project. Um, so the job was make films that sit on Channel 4 and what does Channel 4 stand for? And it stands still, I think, for all those things of risk and innovation and new talent and asking difficult questions and certainly doing things differently. Um, and so when I look at that, I go, is it okay? The worst thing that can happen to those films if they're not huge hits at the box office, and I promise you most of them won't be, is that they'll play on Channel 4. And that's a little bit about how I spend my money. The worst thing that will happen with those films is that it will be valuable to television. Um, and that's 
that's good because that gives me strength as a broadcaster. I stand for something, I have a remit, I have a purpose, I have an ambition to do things with new talent, to do things differently, and the worst that will happen is that my films will look like Channel 4's doing its job. Hurrah. The best that will happen is that the films will work in the UK for an English audience, for a British audience, then they'll be bought by distributors in America or around the world. Very, very hard for the Japanese often to buy our films, but sometimes it happens, hey, that's brilliant too. But that we're speaking to a worldwide audience with some of these films is really fantastic, which means as an artist, writing a screenplay, directing a film, having an idea, the film journey can take you round the world. But it doesn't have to, because all I can do is be me in that office, and all my team can do is be them, and all we can do is articulate what we as British audience really understand of this film. So we do have some sense of what a British audience will make of the film, and certainly what a Channel 4 audience will make of the film. So, for example, The Inbetweeners, which was a film that was a film full film, which made a huge amount of money. The one thing we knew about that film was that there were people who loved The Inbetweeners because we knew how many, how many people watched it and we knew how many people bought the DVD. So there was, a, there was a value we could put on that film in a clever way beyond the talent, first-time film director, first-time screenwriters, you know, of course, known product. But we knew that that audience had an appetite for that film. There was a, you know... There was a better case scenario than we could ever have imagined when it made 45 million at the box office. But, you know, it wasn't going to make less than five. And that's pretty great when you can take talent into a film world and broaden their careers and broaden their relationship with their audience. Um, what we do is now is we spend 15 million a year. Is this all right for you guys? Yeah? yeah? Okay, good. Um, uh, we spend 15 million a year. And 15 million is twice as much as I had the day after Slumdog. The day after Slumdog, I, and actually not the day, the week after Slumdog, I was at the Toronto Film Festival. I felt great. And I know now why never to feel great. Because we'd won the Audience Award with Slumdog Millionaire, and we'd won the Critics Prize with Hunger, which was Steve McQueen's first film. We could not have won any other prizes, really. Um, I was on cloud nine. I came back to the office and I thought, this is great, they're going to be so nice to me, I'm going to get a bonus this year. <laughs> anyway, I was on 10 million at this point, and uh, Andy, Duncan wants to, he, Andy Duncan was chief executive at the time, and uh, Andy Duncan called me into his office and he says, look, we're going to have to cut your budget. <laughs> and I, exactly, I'm pleased you're making that face. Um, I think my face didn't just drop, I think my cheeks were completely soaking wet. I couldn't quite believe it, and I said, well, you know, we've just had this film at I mean, Slumdog hadn't come out. None of them had seen it. Um, and we, he cut us down to 7 million. So after Slumdog, we were cut down to 7 million. Um, and it took a new chief executive, David Abraham, who's actually talked here, um, to come and say, well, actually, I think what you're doing is pretty good. Let's put you back up to 10. And then, actually, he put us back up to 15. He put us up to 15, which we hadn't been for a very, very long time. And what that's meant is I'm able to really do this, in a way, with the kind of work we do and the kind of investment I put into films. And this is how I split it in my head. It doesn't work exactly like this, but this is how I split it. I spend about 3 million quid a year developing screenplays, making short films, optioning books. So that's just development. That is a huge amount of money. You know, you think that's 20% of my entire budget. That's a huge amount of money. And I do it for lots of very good reasons. But the most important of, it, of them is it buys my future. It buys all of our future in film. It does the thing of saying, I don't know when these scripts are going to deliver. I don't know when these books or whether I'm going to be able to find a way through them in adaptation. I don't know whether this idea and research is going to go somewhere. I don't know whether this short film is going to make a filmmaker, show me a filmmaker that's any good. But, you know, this is the cheapest risk I take, given that most films now cost millions and many millions, not just one. This is really good money. This is money that gives me a chance to ask those questions and do it in a safe way. Um, of course, if I was any other business, I'd do it for less, but film is very expensive. So I've got to spend the money to get those projects going. And we develop about between 80 and 100 projects a year. We make five short films a year. And we make short films because we want to find out whether the directors want to make big films and can make big films. And it allows us to put directors with editors, with DPs, put them in teams to ask the question whether they're working with the right people, whether they know to ask the right questions in the edit suite, whether they've got the right relationships with their teams, whether actually often they're writers, often they're performers, they actually really like the job of being the captain of the ship for that period of time. They often find out that they don't. And that's quite interesting. 
Um, so my three million is, I think, my best money spent. So if it goes over a little bit, I forgive myself because it is the best money. And it's also the best money for tactical reasons. If you think that those films, the big ones, tend to be bought and need to be bought in order to get made by other money. And my job is to make sure that I'm building the right projects with the right people and then making sure that they end up as those projects. Because what happens on that journey when money comes in is things change, things shift. You know, you start with this lovely, beautiful idea and other people come into it. And, and actually, this is the conversation we should have as, write, you know, as writers, what it means to be mediated by so many things and by so many people. And how do you hold that as safe as possible? Well, money does that in the film industry. And money's expectations does that in the film industry. And it does it with bigger money. And that's very scary. I mean, you can handle it. People do handle it, and some people handle it brilliantly. But if I say to you that a director I'm working with now, who's, made, who's won some Oscars, um, who, um, or he's certainly his films have won Oscars, not he, oh no, he's won an Oscar, um, called me up and said, such and such a company don't want me to work with Paul Dano. He's not one of them. And I'd go, my, my instinct was Paul Dano's a brilliant, brilliant actor. He's brilliant for the part. Theirs is, he hasn't worked in certain films for us, therefore he's not right. I mean, I'm speaking out of turn to tell you how specific this money can be about what it will and won't work with. So what we're trying to do is have enough purchase on the material to have built it with the talent so that when we come out to finance, when we go out to finance, actually they have to please us. And they have to please us in a number of ways. They have to want to make, make the same film as us. They have to keep our name on the film. If I tell you when Fox Searchlight bought Slumdog Millionaire, it was a finished film. Finished. Fox Searchlight have a fantastic logo. You'll know it much better than ours. Um, you know how Universal have the world, and they all have the world somehow in their logos, the <laughs> Americans. But anyway, they said, well, we'll buy the film as long as Film 4's logo comes off the film. <laughs> This had been five years of my life. But hey, they thought it was very important that we weren't visible. And I would say to them, look, we're happy for you to be on our film. What's your problem with us being there with you? You know, it's, and, it's, you know we, we, we just don't like it. P audiences don't like logos. And I go, well, then you don't have a logo. You know, you don't get it. <laughs> um, but at that point, Danny Boyle did get on the phone and he said, look, if they don't let you have your logo, my credit will be a photograph of me with a Film 4 T-shirt on, so don't worry about <laughs> it. Um, which was very nice of him. But owning the material, if people want what I own, because, of course, I'm buying rights, I'm owning the material, or at least there's a lien on the material in the way that I've invested in it for development, I can say, sorry, guys, but it's not for sale without Film 4's name on it. It's not for sale unless I can buy these rights in it. Because what my money's doing when it comes beyond development in making it, getting the film to get made is it's spending money in two ways. I'm, let's say I spend a million pounds on a film... Half a million of those pounds will be to buy the rights to play that film on telly, to play that film on, on Film 4, on Channel 4, through a VOD service, through a catch-up service, all those rights. The other rights, to play that film in cinemas, to play that film around the world, are bought by other pieces of the cake, the way the film is put together. My other half a million is like I'm gambling. I'm throwing it into the pot. I'm saying, will this money come back at me? But that money is the money that allows me a place at the table with the big boys. So it really doesn't matter that they think I'm short and old and silly and not, don't have the confidence to talk as boldly and, you know, pompously as them. But it does mean that they can't get rid of me because I can sit by my filmmaker and say, but I'm sorry, guys, I've got half a million quid in this. I don't approve that DP. I don't think we should get rid of that DP or I will stand by that editor. And when Martin McDonough made in Bruges and we made the film with the studio and it was a, he was so hot, you know, everybody wanted to make that film... Um, and they literally, the studio stood over him and sent somebody to be on set with him throughout the shoot. I went on the shoot probably, I don't know, my husband will tell me, five times, and said, get that person off the set, <laughs> get them away from Martin. Or if Martin said, I'm worried about this, they want to sack my DP, I'd, I'd say, I'd be picking up the phone and going, you can't sack him. That, that's not going to happen. But it gave me enough welly to be able to do that, and that was unbelievably valuable. So all these things are about what role you want to play, really, and how you can keep the simple idea in your head. Um, I mean, the, the, the big thing that, that I, from, from Andy's summary of what I was going to talk about is, is probably about writing and about how, you know, how fundamental a good script is in what we do. Um, but it's a really big decision to write a screenplay. 
and it's a really de big decision to decide as a writer that you want to be in film because it's entirely other from every experience you'll have as a writer because you are going to be, um, I was speaking, Bruno? Yeah. Boris, I'm so sorry. That's terrible. I thought I was going to look so cool to remember your name. Um, Bruno's a good name, but Boris is better. Um, but saying, you know, that thing of, of having layers and layers and layers of people. So how lovely to be a screenwriter and know that you've got a team of people to work with. But you do know, don't you, that your idea is going to be fashioned by so many things other than you. And by the time it reaches its audience... If you recognise it, God, you're lucky. I mean, when Meg Rossoff saw How I Live Now, and she wrote the book, not the screenplay, I, I said to her, you've got to see this again. You can't just respond to the first screening. And now she's seen it four times, and she's written to Kevin every time. I love this film, I love this film. And I'm thinking, you're so lucky, because most novelists really don't love an adaptation of their film. John Le Carre has just seen Anton Corbin's film, Most Wanted Man. And I saw him for lunch last week, which was, a, I mean, he's a very grand man, a wonderful man. And... Um, he said, I just want you to know that I saw the film yesterday and I absolutely love it now. And I thought, that, that you can't imagine how <laughs> wonderful that feeling is. That, that, that the, you know, the original idea, the, you know, the protector of the flame in a way can say, yeah, this is what I meant. But really, you're going into the jaws of a beast as a writer in a film because you're going to work with a load of editors. You're going to work with a load of people who will have loads of ideas. So it's fine to be polite, but it's really fine to say no. Um, you know, that whole thing of negotiating what you do to a script and how it works and judging your challenges, who's on your side as they challenge you and who isn't. You know, who really understands what you're doing and who doesn't, who sees the film the way you do and who doesn't. And then you're going to be mediated by producers and director and the director's, in the end, going to be a possessor of that idea. How many films are un film de, <laughs> you know... A film by. It's a film by a director. That doesn't make it true, and it doesn't make it the way all directors feel about it, but it is the way a writer often feels, feels about the process of delivering their screenplay into the hands of a director, um, because a director will choose who's in it, who shoots it, who edits it, the colours that people... Wear. I mean, every basic decision, once you, whatever you've written, will be altered by a vision of a director. And you might be on set all the way through, and that would be wonderful, but it will still nevertheless be that thing of having a mediation of somebody else's vision. Then you'll have a distributor who'll sell your film in a particular way. You know, Slumdog Millionaire, the best feel-good movie of the year. The writer went mad. He said, but the kids... <laughs> he said something like, you know, the kids have their eyes gouged out. You know, that isn't... Um, but it's true. But, you know, the distributor knew something else, which was that he was selling a pink... I remember the font was pink, wasn't it? a pink fonted film when we thought we'd made a scrubby film in India. But, you know, but, but actually the distributor then mediated again what, what they were selling. Luckily, that film was well enough known to reach people who might have seen it anyway, um, you know, who might not have seen it in a way because the distributor's vision of it was other from the film itself. But all these things mediate between you and your relationship to your audience, whereas a novel doesn't. Um, a play does less, you know, and television less, that, uh, that, that film is the, is the medium, I think, which you most have to understand whose jaws you're going into. That doesn't mean to say that you won't come out the other end and be thrilled, but it is a very big decision. Um, and, uh, you know, the greatest pleasure for me is in, the, in protecting the authorship, and the authorship can, of course, be in the hands of more than one person. Um, but certainly, when I worked as head of drama at Channel 4, I felt that the authorship of the pieces I was commissioning was very much in the writer's hands. And certainly, in Film 4, I would generally feel that the authorship is in the director's hands. And that doesn't mean to say that every one of those projects you saw little clips of up there have different stories to tell. Frank, you know, Michael Fassbender and the Papier Mache Head is very much John Ronson's idea. And Lenny Abramson came on later on. Um, but, you, could, you know, I can tell you that John Ronson and Peter Strawn wanted to make sure that they felt comfortable with a lot of the choices that Lenny was making, and they do. But that's quite an unusual journey for a film. A lot of the films start very much like Under the Skin, John Glazer's film, with a director's idea. That was a book. It was a Michel Faber book. But my goodness, is it altered and changed and melded and moulded into his hands. 
you know, film is about a lot of artists. Film is about musicians, as well as writers, as well as directors, as well as actors, as well as brilliant sound designers, as well as brilliant stage designers. I mean, it's about so many people collaborating to do something well. So the pleasure for me is in all those people being pulled together in something that might deliver a, a real gem. <laughs>